<clears throat> Good morning and Happy New Year. I'm Zane Cayley, and I'd like to welcome you to Sterling First United Methodist Church. We're so glad that you've come to worship with us this morning in person and or via the live stream. Just a few quick announcements before we get started. First of all, happy 2023. And thank you so much for joining us as the youth take over this service as we ring in the new year. And just a quick reminder that our Wednesday night meals will be back January 4th and our full Wednesday night lineup, oh, and our full Wednesday night lineup with Connect Kids, Connect Students, will resume on January 11th. If we can be in prayer for you, please let us know via the church office. We'd love to be praying for you in any way that we can. If there are no other announcements, please turn your attention to the worship team as we prepare for our hearts for worship. Well, good morning. Good morning. As Zane said, we got a few extra, extra people up here. We're super excited to have the youth taken over the service this morning. Well, as we transition into a time of worship, I'd love to read just a few verses out of Lamentations 3. And it says, Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord, and it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. So let's stand together and let's worship in this new year. Turn graves into gardens. You turn 
turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's Would you pray with me? Father God, we just thank you so much for the blessing it is to gather in this place to worship you in a new year. And God, I just pray that you would help us to embrace the newness that has come our way, that we would be refreshed in the midst of it. And that, Lord, we would remember that although things may change in this life, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can rest in that, even when the newness feels strange or difficult um, or even painful sometimes. God, you are still good in the midst of it all. And God, we just pray that the change that we see would be growth in your kingdom. That we would see new people coming to the faith, coming to follow you coming to worship you, and coming to build up your kingdom here on earth. God, we yearn for that so much, Lord. So God, as we worship, let that be our cry, that you would build your kingdom through each and every one of us, and through people we haven't even met yet, um, that you will call to your way as well. God, we love you so much. We praise you, and we pray all of this in your name. Amen. Come sing your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope, like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. We hunger and we thirst. We refuse to waste our lives. For your our joy and prize. To see the captive's hearts release. The hurt, the sick, the poor.
You may be seated, and kiddos, you can come on down for children's time. Okay, good morning, guys. How was your guys' Christmas? Was it good? Okay, we're going to play a little game. We're going to play Simon Says. Okay, but we're going to play Katie Says, okay? <laughs> so, Katie Says, stand up. Okay, Katie Says, touch your nose. Katie Says, touch your ear. Touch your eye. Okay, Katie Says, Jump up and down. Um, okay, Katie says touch your nose. Touch your mouth. Okay, you guys are all really good at Simon Says. Okay, you guys can all sit down. <laughs> okay, so today in the scripture, it's going to talk about Jesus sharing the word of eternal life to all these people. And some of the people there didn't believe him, so they just left. But the people who did believe him, which were the 12 disciples, stayed, and they got to be on like his mission journey with him for the rest of his life. So, like in Simon Says, where some of the things you were asked to do might have been hard, God is going to ask us to do some hard things in life. But he's going to be right as we do those hard things. Some of you also might have messed up while we are playing Simon Says, except you guys were really good, so not too many of you messed up. <laughs> but... If you do mess up, it's okay, because God is going to be there with us when we mess up, and he's willing to forgive us for our mistakes. Okay, you guys can all have a piece of candy for playing Simon Says. And as you eat the candy, remember that God might ask us to do hard things in life, but he'll always be with you to do them with you. So will you guys pray with me? Dear God, thank you for always being there with us, and help us to ri rely and trust in your plan, even if it is a little scary at times. Amen. Amen. All right, while they get wrapped up, um, today's scripture is going to be John 6, 60 through 69. And it says, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of, dis many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Thank you so much, Brayden. Thank you, Katie, for children's time. And thank you to all the teens who have been participating today on Teen Sunday. Really glad you guys are here. Good morning, church. Good morning. Happy New Year to you. I'm extremely excited that you have joined us today. Uh, to get started, uh, I figured I should probably explain a little bit. Uh, we had a New Year's lock-in uh, because for some reason I knew I was going to be preaching on New Year's Day and then thought to myself, let's do a lock-in too. That's a good idea. <laughs> it, it worked out. <laughs> uh, but I told the teens, hey, come in your pajamas and if you come to the lock-in, you know, you can chill out with us in Sunday Fellowship in your PJs. And my wife was like, hey, you should like dress half pajamas and like fancy up top for the rest of the congregation. And I was like, that's a great idea. One teen is wearing their pajamas. 
So shout out to you, Kaylin. You're the MVP today. <laughs> No. Guys, I'm glad you're here with us. I hope you had an incredibly uh, fun and festive Christmas and New Year's with your family, with your friends. I hope you've had an opportunity to at least rest a little bit over these holidays, and I look forward to diving into the scripture with you today. But the scripture is a challenging one, and I want to set the context of John chapter 6 because we jumped in right at the very end of it. You see, John 6 begins with the story many of us are probably familiar with, Jesus feeding the 5,000. But the Gospel of John gives this story a unique take compared to the other Gospels. Thousands have come to see Jesus and his miracles, and Jesus tests Philip, one of the disciples, by asking him where they can buy bread for all of these people. This question, and Philip's response, is to show us that Jesus knows the human heart and is always in control of the situation. So Jesus gives out the bread himself as well in the Gospel of John, showing that he gives himself in extravagant abundance. Jesus and his disciples leave after they perform this miracle of feeding the 5,000 because the Jews, after seeing this miracle, were ready to take him by force and make him king. You see, the king that they had hoped for would liberate them from Rome. And in the next part of the story, we see that the disciples, after having left the crowd, are out at sea. And while they're out at sea, they see Jesus standing on the water. They're scared. But Jesus calls out to them, It is I, do not be afraid. It is I could also be translated to I am, the divine name from Exodus chapter 3 showing that Jesus is the presence of God who alone can walk on water. Moving on throughout the chapter, and the next day the crowd sees that Jesus has gone, and they follow him to Capricum, and asking him why he has gone there. Jesus' answer starts by calling out this crowd a little bit. He says, I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Jesus here is telling them that they have followed him not because of who he is or what he is here to do, but because of how the crowd has benefited from him so far. After this, Jesus begins teaching and using different images to the crowd, such as believing, working, coming, and seeing, to depict what a relationship with him would look like, and to try and help them understand what following him is going to be like. The one that stands out the most is when Jesus says, I am the bread of life. You see, unlike the other, <clears throat> excuse me, you see, unlike the other alleged life-giving gifts, Jesus satisfies human need fully and permanently. From there, Jesus shares to all who believe in him, the Son will have eternal life with him and the Father. And at this point, we have to take a pause because, whoo! Jesus has dropped a lot of theology on these people, some really intense stuff, statements that me, you, a lot of us here have had a lifetime to take in, a lifetime to try and understand. But this, this is the first time that the Jews are hearing this, and they are not taking it well. Jesus goes on to say, very well, very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. This is John 6, 53 to 54, where he says this. And the Jews, after hearing this, begin to complain about him. They don't understand what he's saying. They're saying things like, I don't understand. Why would he said, say this? I just came for the free bread. Now he's saying he's the bread, and I'm really uncomfortable. They don't get it. They don't understand what he is saying to them. They loved it when Jesus fed them, but when he tried to teach them, they got confused, uncomfortable, and angry. They echoed the complaints of the Israelites wandering in the desert, for even in the desert, God provided for them. Yet still they were ungrateful, confused, and even bitter in that time. We then get to our scripture today, where the disciples and followers of Jesus are struggling with his words as well. 
They wonder who on earth is going to accept the words that Jesus has just spoken. And Jesus knows what they're thinking and what they're saying. And he asks one question, does this offend you? I love that question. He then tells the disciples that he has spoken to them words of spirit and life, but still among them are people who cannot heed these words, who cannot understand them, who do not believe them. He then says no one can come to him unless it is granted by the Father. And after this, we see the crowds, the thousands of people, leave until Jesus is just left with the twelve disciples. And Jesus asks them if they, too, wish to go away. And Peter says, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. Chapter 6 of John begins with 5,000 people following Jesus, and it ends with 12. It ends with Peter professing that Jesus is the Holy One of God. You know, as I prepared this sermon, I kept thinking about what Jesus asked the disciples, does this offend you? And that's such a fascinating question to me, because what they don't realize is the things that Jesus is saying to them is tied directly to their salvation, the thing that will save them, the words of eternal life, the words of eternal life. And he had to ask if it offended them. And we see the difference between the followers and the disciples that left and those that stayed. You see, those that left were clearly offended by what Jesus had said, and they decided that it wasn't worth it to follow him anymore. It could have been due to them misunderstanding his words, not getting from Jesus what they wanted or a variety of other factors. But the disciples, those who stayed, the twelve, they were also offended and confused by what Jesus says. It says it right there in the scripture that they were. It's why Jesus posed the question to them in the first place. Does this offend you? But the difference is, despite the fact that they don't fully understand, despite the fact that they may have been bothered by his words, they still believed, despite their frustration, they believed. And Peter says it perfectly when he says, Lord, to whom can we go? To whom can we go? You had the words of eternal life. You see, Jesus' word stuns the people so much that many of them leave. But what Peter says speaks for all people who have encountered God's grace. Lord, to whom can we go? So, that leads me to a question that I have for you all today. And we're going to play this a little bit differently than we do in a traditional service. Because it's Teen Sunday, I would like to do with you guys something that we normally do in youth group. I'm going to ask you a question and then I want you to take a second to discuss that question with the people around you. It's how a lot of studies show that you keep teenagers engaged. So we're going to see if it works on the adults now. So my question to you is this. What offends you about Jesus? I'm going to ask that question one more time. What offends you about Jesus? Discuss in your group.
I know it seems like a weird chess question, but give it a chance, think about it. Pay attention, teens. These guys are engaged way longer than you ever are. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, very good. Thank you so much, guys. You see, Jesus was and is perfect. And through the process of sanctification that we go through as believers, as we become more and more like Jesus through our faith journey, we will have to tackle and deal with the sin in our lives. It's a part of following Jesus. It's a part of growing closer to him that we have to deal with that uncomfortable part of ourselves, that we have to acknowledge and confront the sin that we have. We are called to live holy lives as followers of Jesus. And as we strive for holiness, we're going to be offended sometimes. It's a part of our sin nature we do not want to give God the things of this world that we cling so tightly to. But we are called to do so. And as difficult as it might be sometimes, and as offended as we're going to be sometimes, we are challenged to let our worldly sin and things go. We are called to give it to God. So, what offends you? Is it the command to love God before all things? Is it to love your neighbor and everyone as yourself? Is it to love those who are hard to love or who may even you might consider an enemy? To love on someone who might persecute you? Do you, do you struggle or are you offended by the command to honor your father and your mother? Are you keeping the Sabbath day holy. I would ask if you struggle with killing, but that would be a really awkward amen from somebody if we put that one out there. <laughs> I know that for me personally, I struggle with forgiveness sometimes. As a general rule of thumb, I'm pretty happy to forgive and forget as soon as possible, but I struggle to hold on to it in the long term sometimes. You see, some of the best advice my own youth pastor gave me was to be like a duck. Be like a duck. Some of you are like, what, quack? No. <laughs> Water rolls right off of ducks. And what my youth pastor would always say is you need to be like a duck. Let the things that offend you and bother you roll right off. You will be a much more effective disciple of Jesus that way. And there is absolute truth in that and some of the best advice I've ever received for ministry. And by the grace of God, I continue to work towards embracing God's goodness and grace and how I can share that with other people, share his forgiveness. But I'm still shocked how on some days when my mind begins to wonder to things that happened years ago, maybe even more than 10 years ago, and I get mad when I think about them. Things that were said between friends, family, classmates, a random encounter I had as a cashier when I worked as one at Dylan's. Those things still pop in my head sometimes and they bother me. They upset me. And I let that anger and I let those thoughts stay in my head longer than I should. And they have no business living rent free there. And it's a struggle to let those things affect you. It's a struggle to let those things go. And on my worst days, I let that frustration and I let that anger sit with me. But that anger, that pain, it needs to be let go. It gets to go to God. I get to give that to him. And I get to move on and I get to express and embrace the love and grace that God has given me, and to share that with others with no conditions or anything attached to it, including those who may have hurt me, who may have never apologized for it, who maybe never even knew. 
And that is a good thing. Because if God can love and forgive me for all the sins and all the junk in my life, then I should dive headfirst into the grace and forgiveness that he also offers others. And that is just a taste of how good God's grace is. But I gotta be honest, in my immaturity, in my growing, in the times where I'm angry and frustrated and I know that I'm called to forgive them, I'm offended. I'm mad. Because those people aren't necessarily calling me to forgive them. God is. It is put on my life as a believer of Jesus that I am to forgive others. And that offends me sometimes. Why is that a calling on my life? Why do I have to be the peacemaker? But it is a part of being called to be holy. And it is why we chase after the Lord. It is why we follow him as disciples to become more and more like him, even when it's hard, even when we don't get it, and maybe, just maybe, even when it offends us. I had another mentor of mine from Sterling College who challenged me and encouraged me on one of the bad days that I had. I was sharing with him some of the frustration that I had going on in life, frustration I had in ministry, with my family, with different friends, and he listened well. He listened very well. He let me get the things off my chest that were weighing heavy on me. But after that, he shared with me a challenge, and an encouragement. He went on to explain that a pastor and a mentor he had had years ago had encouraged him with this same thing as he was letting out his frustration, his anger, and venting to his pastor. And his pastor listened, he took in the words that my mentor shared with him, and he said this to him in return. Are you the Christian? Are you the follower of Jesus? He's like, well, yeah, I am. Then you are called to be the peacemaker, period. If you have frustration, anger, sadness at anybody, your friends, your family, your coworkers, you're allowed to feel those things. But it all goes back to that question for me, are you the Christian? Are you the person that follows Jesus? And if the answer is yes, then you are called to be the peacemaker. And that advice has always stuck with me, and it's been always at the forefront of my ministry, trying to embrace and show what it looks like to be the peacemaker. Unless you're a Broncos fan, I'm still working through that. Sorry. Check the Chiefs' sandals, or slippers, whatever they are. Go Chiefs today. <laughs> But the point is, it's not always easy to be the peacemaker, but it does almost always have the most significant impact on people. When they receive grace and forgiveness, when they don't deserve it. When you're the one who extends the loving hand in the relationship. It is when you are the most effective in ministry, and I will always stand by that. So, that goes back to our question. What about Jesus offends you? What do you need to give to him? How, as you answer the call to live a holy life, to become more like Jesus, do you need to give to him? The Gospel of John is known for embracing and continually touching on the supernatural aspects of Jesus. It's what separates it from the other three Gospels in particular, how he disappears from hostile crowds, how Jesus always knew what was in the hearts of men, and his other miracles like walking on water, healing the blind and the sick, feeding the thousands. There is a big push for the supernatural element of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And because of that, some have argued that they're worried that the humanness of Jesus is almost forgotten about. When we read about this Jesus, it can be easy to be offended by him and the things that he calls us to do because he was supernatural. He was perfect. 
How could he possibly understand that we are supposed to be like him? But Richard Hayes states perfectly in his book, The Moral Vision of the New Testament. You see, Hayes is talking about how even though there are all these supernatural elements highlighted in John, that John's narrative also contains numerous features that convey the physical concreteness and human reality of the incarnation of Jesus. John gives us a Jesus who is thirsty and asks a Samaritan woman for a drink, a Jesus who weeps at Lazarus' grave, a Jesus who strips off his clothes, takes a towel, and washes away the grimy feet of his followers. Jesus is the Word become flesh, and his flesh is not merely a vestment donned for revelation play. He is a man who knows the pain and joys and sorrows of embodied existence. All that to say is that God understands us. He knows us. He can relate to what we are going through, and he has unconditional love for us throughout all of it. So I encourage you to ponder this question. How does Jesus offend you? What call to live a holy life, to become more like Jesus? What is getting in the way of that call? What do you need to give to him? What do you need to start having a conversation about? Because it is our job as believers to become more and more like Jesus, to glorify him as we go throughout our faith journey. But what's offending you? What's getting in your way? And it's okay for you to struggle because part of living a, life, living a holy life and striving towards it is tackling that sin and that frustration in our lives. But what we see here from our scripture today is that there are two ways that we get to react to it. The first is to be like the crowd, to enjoy the benefits of being a follower of Jesus until we're challenged, until we're pushed, until we don't like what he says. And then we turn our backs. We're not willing to confront that challenge. Or we can be like Peter. We can be like the other disciples. They were frustrated. They didn't understand. They were offended. But Peter's response to those emotions and to those feelings is to say, Lord, to whom else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. Let us be like Peter. Let us be the kind of people who even when we struggle with frustration, with sin, with what we're supposed to do next in our faith journey is to say, Lord, where else do I go? I know you have the eternal words of life. You don't have to understand all the time. You don't have to get it all the time. But you can rest and rely on the words knowing that we follow a Father who loves us, who understands us, and offers us the words of eternal life. Growing pains are hard. It's the process of being a believer. But I sincerely hope that as you ponder the question of what offends you, that you will see Jesus' grace, love, and mercy in your life. As we move on to prayers of the people, it's the new year. We're excited, guys. It is a great time to be here. So let's start by opening up with joys. Who has joys that they would like to share? Your family's here today. Amen. God bless family spending time with them in fellowship. What else? Do we have any other joys here today? The teens didn't burn down the church. I'll mark that a joy. <laughs> any other joys? All right. What about concerns? How can we as a body be praying for you? I know I look silly, but I swear I'm being genuine. How can we be in prayer for you? Okay. 
Let's go ahead and go into a time of prayer. Lord, thank you so much for your grace and for your mercy. Thank you for getting us through 2022. And Lord, let us take a minute to just ponder. Ponder what's in our hearts. Ponder, Lord, what gets in the way of us following after you even more. What's getting in the way of us becoming more and more like you. Lord, what offends us? What worldly thing are we holding on to that, God, we just need to give up to you? And God, that's a hard question. It's not a question that should be answered like that, but it's one we should ponder. It's one we should pray about. And it's one that I hope, God, that we are willing to sincerely contemplate and sincerely give to you. Lord, the frustration, the anger, the sin in our lives that hold us back from glorifying you and sharing you with other people. Let us take a moment here and just be willing to give that to you, God. Because you put a hard call on our lives. You call us to be like you, to live holy. And Lord, we fall short. We mess up. We get frustrated and we get angry. But God, we are grateful that we have a Savior like you who even in those mess-ups, even in that sin that we deal with in our lives, you are still gracious. You are still loving. And God, you still want us. Lord, let us know that you want us and let us give to you the worldly things in our life that we need to let go. And God, as we continue this time of prayer, we pray in the way that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us continue in worship as we bring our blessings, our joys, and our trials to the altar. Thank you. A 
Thank you, Wesley, for giving the message. And he volunteered. He wanted to do that. And I'm, I'm just so, it excites me to see people of a different generation than myself wanting to, to serve and to share. And you've been the great voice uh, to share a great message, Wesley. So thank you. And thank you to the teens for stepping up and sharing your gifts of your voices and and all that you've done uh, to help lead our congregation this morning. And thank you to the others that spent the night last night. I'm so glad that wasn't me. <laughs> so go home and take a good nap uh, this afternoon. And, and my job is to give you the benediction, but are we going to sing a song before the benediction or do you want to do the benediction now, Jordan? You want to sing, and then I'll give the benediction. Okay. All right. So would you all stand together as we sing our closing hymn number 349, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. just the voices. Now go and rest and enjoy this new year that God has given us and go now in great joy and peace and love and hope. We have fellow time for fellowship in Fellowship Hall and be here next week and we will celebrate Epiphany Sunday. And so you can Google that, figure it out, but it'll be a great special day. You don't want to miss it. You don't want to miss it. So go now in God's great grace. Thank you.